introduce our speaker tonight. And the topic is going to be the gravity, um, the DNH and the gravity railroad. And it's that we've invited Dr. Robert Powell to come to Saratoga Springs to come give a lecture to us. Um, Dr. Powell is one of the um, the founders of the Carbondale Historical Society and the Carbondale DNH Transportation Museum, and that's in Carbondale, Pennsylvania. And he served um, on both boards and is president of both organizations for over 35 years. Um, too, he, long. Hmm? too long. Too long. <laughs> <laughs> he has a PhD in French literature from Indiana University, taught humanities at SUNY Oswego, Brooklyn College, Susquehanna University, and Penn State. For the past 20 years, he's been working on a comprehensive history of the Delaware and Hudson Canal Company, the predecessor's name to the DNH Railroad. Um, and the final four volumes in the series are just um, coming out as ebooks this summer, and that's what we have over here, our um, DVDs from the series. So with that, I would like to invite to the podium Dr. Robert Powell. Thank you. It is a great pleasure to be in this remarkable building in this remarkable town to talk about a remarkable railroad, the Delaware and Hudson Canal Company. The, uh, the railroad began in 1829, but there's some interesting stuff that went on before the railroad opened. In America, in the second decade of the 19th century, America's first energy crisis was in high gear. All the trees essentially had been cut down and America was shivering, looking for a fuel. If, you, if there's a wood-burning stove in your world, you know how quickly a wood pile can disappear. And if you multiply that by many thousands of people, all the coastal cities in America were literally without fuel. All the hillsides were denuded of trees. And as I say, this energy crisis was going on. At the same time, the War of 1812 was going on with a blockade of the eastern seaboard by the British. So no coal could be imported from Great Britain nor could coal be brought up to the, to the, to the cities of Philadelphia and New York and, and, on, and on the coast of America uh, from those coal fields. So there, there was a major crisis going on uh, with, with energy in the, early, in, the, in the second decade of the 19th century. Fortuitously, uh, Morris and William Wirtz, who were two dry goods merchants in Philadelphia, they provided the government, the federal government, with uniforms in this war of 1812. And the, war, and the government decided to pay these guys off, not in cash, but give them land. And I think probably what was going on in the mind of those who gave the Wirtz brothers this land was probably, I think, I, I'm just, I think, I'm, maybe I'm inventing, but I don't think so. They probably said, let's give those guys some land up there in the northeastern part of the state. Wild land, let's see if they'll take that in payment for the, uh, for the money we owe them. Well, as it turns out, the Wirtz brothers were given 484 square miles of anthracite coal, <laughs> the richest anthracite deposit in North America. Unbelievable resource that they were given. And one thing led to another, and they developed this resource. The, other, the coal fields extended uh, south of northeastern Pennsylvania in the direction of Philadelphia. And there were, and there were enterprising folks in, in that part of the state who began to, they all had to learn how to burn coal. Once they learned how to burn coal, the southern anthracite fields, they were using, they, they were sending their coal down to Philadelphia, which was a comparatively easy process because there were a lot of canals in existence in, in, that, in that part of the state. And so the, the coal was being shipped south by means of these canals uh, to, to Philadelphia. In the northern part of the state, where in northeastern Pennsylvania, in Carbondale, in that area specifically, uh, the Wirtz brothers, Morris and William, decided to, they, they had to find a, an appropriate market for their coal. The southern markets were pretty much controlled by other, other coal operators. And so Morris and William Wirtz uh, hit upon the idea of, of marketing their coal in New York City. The only problem with marketing their coal in, in New York City was the fact that all these deposits were for the most part in the Lackawanna and Wyoming valleys, which were sort of like fingers going north-south in, in that part of the state. And in order to get that coal from the Lackawanna Valley to New York, it meant taking it over some of these mountain ridges. There, there was a mountain to the, uh, the Moosic Mountain to the east of Carbondale. It was almost uh, 900 feet, more or less, above the valley floor. 
So all, this, all these millions of tons of coal were here on the valley floor, and they had to get it over, get this coal 900 feet in the air over the mountain to even think about getting the coal to New York City. So these, these Wirtz brothers were, were very savvy folks, and, and it, it's characteristic of them, and very much also of the DNH for the, for the next 100 years. They always got the brightest and best involved in solving their problems. They were very good managers. I think there, there's, a, there's a book to be written on the management style of the DNH. They were spectacular managers. Get the brightest and best people involved. So the Wirtz brothers decided that probably a combination of, a, of, of some kind of rail system over the mountain plus a canal system might be the way to get this coal to market. So they, they, one of their first acts was in 18, the company was incorporated in 23, but in 1823, remarkably, these guys, Morris and William Wirtz, got in touch with the Erie Canal folks, Benjamin Wright and John Jarvis and those folks building the Erie Canal. In 1823, the Erie Canal wasn't even open. It was, it was under, under construction, but it wasn't open. And in 1823, Morris and William Wirtz contacted the Erie Canal people and said, we think we want to put a canal between maybe the Delaware River and the Hudson River. We need advice. Come down here and help us out. So Benjamin Wright delegated people to come down to northeastern Pennsylvania uh, and, and help them figure out where this canal might go. And he li they literally walked from, well, it's, it's a place called uh, Lackawaxen, to the Hudson River to determine where this canal might go. But there, there's an instance of, having, of getting getting this, this, this unbelievable technology of the Erie. The, the Erie Canal hadn't even been opened yet, and, and the DNH was recruiting counselors from the Erie Canal to help them with their canal. So the, the, the Erie Canal was, was so clearly on a, on, on a success path, we need to get these people to help us uh, with, with our canal plans here. And one of the, and another person they brought down from the Erie Canal was John Jarvis who was one of the most remarkable engineers in the whole 19th century. He really is an astonishing human being, John Jarvis. He was brought down by the DNH to, to Carbondale to help them figure out how to get over this mountain, this, this thousand foot high mountain on, on the side of, of, of Carbondale. Another person who was up there working on the Erie Canal was, was James Archibald, the remarkable James, Ar uh, Ar James Archibald. One of my big heroes is James Archibald. He was a, 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 a 10 year old boy. He was living, he was born on Little Cumbria off the coast of Scotland, came to America as a 10 year old boy. The family, the Archibald family, lived near Rome, New York. And in, in Rome, New York, it just so happened that this thing was going through the back portion of their property called the Erie Canal. And so James Archibald got a job working on the Erie Canal as, as a young boy, and, and, or as in a young man, actually and uh, very soon, very quickly distinguished himself. Next thing you know, he was in charge of a larger section and a larger section and a larger section. A remarkable engineering uh, mind in James Archibald. He too was brought down to, to, uh, to the anthracite fields in Pennsylvania to help them uh, create this transportation system over this mountain. That was the big problem. How do you get over that mountain? And so, uh, based on, on what they learned then from John Jarvis and James Archibald and others, they conceived the idea of creating a gravity railroad over that mountain. The remarkable thing is that they, were, they, were, they, were, they, were, they weren't using existing technology, they were creating the technology as they went along. It wasn't like they were following somebody's pattern on how to, how to do this. Railroads in America didn't exist at the time. So how do you get over this mountain? Well, James R. John, John Jarvis counseled them to, to, to build this, what was called then, a gravity railroad, which, by means of which, the coal cars were brought into the, uh, to the base of a plane uh, in, in Carbondale. And the loaded coal cars were then connected to a cable in an inclined plane, which took them up an incline plane, the inclined plane, at the head of which was a stationary steam engine. So the engines were stationary, but the cars were pulled up the inclined plane to the, to, the, to the top of that plane. In the 1829 configuration, when the railroad opened, the cars were pulled up to the top of that plane, then they were disconnected. They went over, over, like, over the hump at the top, boom. And then they, they were on, to, on a level. 
So this railroad was, was that, that was the basic principle of inclined planes and levels. They got them to the top of the top of, of plane number one, and then they used horses to pull the cars from the top of the plane where they were disconnected from the from the from the inclined plane to pull them across a level. And when the horses then pulled the cars then to the base of what was, for example, then plane number two, the cars were then connected to, to, the, to a cable in plane number two and taken up again. Plane number three, the same process. So that by, by means in 1829 of, of, of five inclined planes up the mountain, they got these coal cars 900 feet in the air. And then the remarkable thing is, and that's where the gravity aspect of this gravity railroad kicks in. You have to work like heck to get these cars to the top of the mountain. But once you get them to the top of the mountain, you have gravity working for you because you have loaded coal cars with many, many tons of coal in, in coal cars on rails. Then the cars were let down a plane on a level, let down, they were, they were still, they were connected to a cable, lowered down, moved, lowered down, lowered down. So that uh, from the top of the mountain, then above Carbondale, uh, is I say where, where gravity began to work for for the railroad. So the same reason, if you were to you know throw a brick from your hand, it falls to the floor. The same reason, these, for that same reason, these coal cars then went down down the uh, down that, the, down the inclined planes and levels on the other side of the mountain. And then at the base of the mountain, in a community called Waymart, these cars were then placed onto what, what they call the the six mile level where the cars were put onto this level and they went for six miles then they were lowered down another plane and they went four miles into the canal basin at Honesdale where they were unloaded into canal boats so that's how they that that was that was the basic process from 18 1829 uh, and they loaded them they loaded the canal boats in bringing, the, in bringing these coal cars, they had to get them coal, the coal cars back to the mines to fill them up again. So they used horses to pull the coal cars back up this, these levels, the six mile level and the four mile level. They pulled them up and they, they hauled them up a plane Then they pulled the horses again, uh, pulled the cars again. Remarkably, the, uh, in order to get, those, keep those, to get the horses where you needed to have them at the right time, when the coal cars were going at the beginning of the six mile level towards Homesdale, there was an empty horse, there was a horse car in which a horse rode down the plane so the horse could be available to then pull the cars back. <laughs> and astonishingly about, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago, I discovered in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, 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 an archive in a historical society, I thought, what in the world am I looking at? I was looking at drawings for the horse cars on the six mile level. I, I, I mean, I, I think my, my, my heart starts beating even faster now when I think of finding what I, what, I, what I chanced upon, drawings for these horse cars on the six mile level. Anyhow, so the cars were then brought back to the, to the base of this mountain, and then they were pulled up the mountain and got to the top of, of, the, top of this mountain above Carbondale. And across the top of the mountain of Carbondale, there were, there were three, three gaps they called them gaps in the mountain where the mountain wasn't quite as high through which the cars could be, could be, could be moved on, the, on, on these levels. On one of these levels in 1829, it was called the five mile level, it was on the top of the mountain, just sort of straight shot across. The, um, it was on that five mile level that the very celebrated Storbridge Lion was uh, intended to be used on. But as I think many or most of you probably know, the storage line was a big failure. It was too heavy for the rails. They took it off the rails and never used it because it, the, the weight of the engine was, was too much for the existing rails. And so the cars then got across the top of the mountain and then were lowered down back into, back into Carbondale. The problem with the 1829 configuration was is it was a, was a single track. And so the cars going to market and the cars coming back from the canal had to use the same track. In the middle of the plains, they had a turnout where you, the car could go in while the car was going the other way. There was a turnout with a switch. You could go in there, wait for it to go by, and then continue on your way whether you were going up or down. A very inefficient system, and they had lots of, lots of, of, of holding patterns because their cars were just having to wait constantly to move to get the to get the right of way, if you will, going over, going to the canal or coming back 
to uh, coming back to Honesdale. So that, that but it, nevertheless, it was an opera, it was a functioning uh, transportation system to get the coal to the canal in 1829. The uh, and, and it worked. And the the the, uh, the objective for 1829 was was to get 100,000 tons of coal to market. And they managed to get 100,000 100,000 tons of coal through this through this system. Even though when they when they and, and they were they were always right there in the front line innovating. How can we make this better? So in, in 1829, they had, they had an operating system, but then they needed to get, as I say, they needed to uh, improve the system. Let me tell you just briefly about these rails. The rails on this, on this original rail line were, were, were strap rails, thin pieces of iron rail, uh, a half inch thick and 15 feet long, flat piece of rail. And these were, these were bolted down to logs, essentially. So the rails in 1829 ran on this very thin piece of iron on the top of, of logs, hemlock logs, strap rail, it's called. And, and the D&H uh, imported from, from England 390 tons of strap rail in order to make this railroad uh, possible when they opened. But the strap rail was used in, in this, in this 18, uh, 1829 configuration. And so, so you have the logs, and then, then on top of that, they put a strip, a, a two-inch thick strip of beech wood, the whole length of that log. Then they put the, then they put the, then they put the iron rail on top of that, and they put the beech wood on because it was so hard. Beech is very hard wood, and it, it and hemlock is a very soft wood comparatively. But they, so they put the beach on there to sort of protect the hemlock and to strengthen the, 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 the bed. People have also told me that, I, 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 have no, I, don't, I don't doubt it, that, that, that uh, lightning never strikes beech trees. That may have entered into their, into their thinking. I, don't, I, I, don't, I can't say one way or another on that, but someone, had, someone at one point said that to me, and I must see if I can verify that. But anyhow, the strap rails in, in 1829 uh, were, were, were very, uh, they worked. But it was, it would, but it was problematic because they were, they were constantly these, these rails. They came together sort of like this, and there was always these, always these snake heads. They call them, where the rails at the ends were sort of popping up, and the rail would go right up through the car and stuff. So, so they used those, those strap rails from 29, and remarkably up until 1858, all railroads, all these, all these DNH rails for like 30 years were these strap rails when they began to use the conventional T, -T rails that we know today. That was in, in, in 1859, they put those into, uh, into operation on, uh, on the system. But the, uh, the strap rails, they did their job, but there were a lot of, a lot of problems. The 1829 configuration did its job, but there were a lot of problems. Very labor intensive, all these horses, getting horses and barns and feeding the horses hay and all. They don't need that if you're gonna efficiently get this coal to market. So in 1845, the remarkable James Archibald who I, who I sort of regard as one of my best friends, even though he's been dead for a long time. <laughs> Anyhow, the, um, the, uh, in 1845, James Archibald said, we've got to redo this, we've got to rethink this line. They managed to get 100,000 tons of coal to market, but that was, that was barely meeting market needs. The market was saying, send us more coal. We need more coal. So this railroad began from, from daybreak until dark six days a week trying to get coal to market. James Archibald, who became the first mayor of Carbondale in, in 1851 when we, we became an incorporated city, Carbondale's nickname is the Pioneer City, Pioneer meaning first. We're the oldest incorporated city in Lackawanna County. And we're very proud of that fact. We're older than Scranton, older than Wilkes-Barre, older than all those other places. And Carbondale is the Pioneer City. Anyhow, James Archibald then said, well, what we've got to do is we've got to make this a double track system. You've got to put in a loaded track and then a light track, and you'll, you'll get clear off these bottlenecks. He also said, you've got to equalize the length of these planes getting over the mountain. Because when the, original, when the line opened in, in 29, some of the planes were relatively short, and a couple of them were very long. So if you're moving a series of cars through planes that are short, long, short, long, you have to, you're always waiting for them to get through the long planes. The short planes, boom, boom, it's done. You gotta wait. When will they get up? So they, 
So James Archibald said, no, we've got to equalize the length of these planes so that it becomes sort of like everybody moves at the same time. You, you, make, you make much better progress that way. So one of his first moves was to, to have the planes uh, re, uh, re, readjusted the length so they're more or less the same length. And also with, with the double tracking, which, which made it, which prevented all these delays along the way. The, um, the system worked, worked beautifully. He had another innovation. When the cars, said he, got to the top of the inclined plane, when they go over this sort of hump and they're on a level, instead of having the level being level, let's make the level on a, on a downward grade so the cars coast from the head of plane number one to the foot of plane number two. It worked beautifully. Wonderful. What a great idea. And they, so they put that in operation on all, on all the loaded planes where the cars coasted from the head of one plane to the foot of the next. That was another time-saving another time uh, feature that James Archibald uh, instituted in, in 45. And so with those, with those just a couple innovations, the, uh, the railroad was make, making much better progress. They were getting more coal to market. At the bottom of the plane at, uh, at Weimart, where this, this so-called the six-mile level and the four-mile level were, he said, look, let's just make it a 10-mile level. Send those cars right from Weimart right to the canal basin. They did, and it worked beautifully. Uh, again, you're getting rid of all those horses and those horse cars and all this business of pulling things around by horses. The cars could just coast right to the canal basin, and they were loaded into the canal wait, awaiting canal boats. Another thing which he did was, uh, was really quite remarkable as he said, what we've got to do is then have a system of planes coming back to the Lackawanna Valley, separated from this 10-mile this level. And so they put in five planes between Waymark, between Homesdale and Carbondale, uh, along a, a little babbling brook through the wilderness, called the Banoffin and then the Lackawaxen. But they put, in, they put in these five planes, at the base of which, I think I'm the only person. I'm, I'm the only person who knows this. At the base of this plane, they had water wheels. It, it would take me 45 minutes to, to tell you how I know that, but I know it to be a fact. Anyhow, the, the, at the base of these planes, they had water wheels, and so they were using the water wheels to provide the motive power to, 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 to operate these, these these stationary engines. So the cars were then brought back from Honesdale to Waymark along this. This, this Van Auken Creek and along the, the Lackawaxen by water wheels, gigantic water wheels at the bottom of, of the bottom of the undershot water wheels at the bottom of the plains. Last summer, I was over there trooping around through the woods at the base of plane number 14, and I, I really couldn't believe what I was seeing. I found the, the beginning of the raceway where they took water from the Lackawaxen and brought it this way at the base of the, plane, base of the plane over there where the water wheel was. You can see, I, I could walk you to the spot where the exit, where, that, where, that, where, that, where the raceway began from the, from the lack of wax. And if you're going to use water wheels, you don't want to, you don't want to, you don't want to mess with putting them in, in, in the actual body of, of a river, because it's, it's too capricious. You get floods, you get, it's, going to, it's going to terrible. You have to make a raceway and bring the amount of water you want to where you need it. So he had, he had these five planes with water wheels put in between Honesdale and, and, uh, and Waymart, five of them, planes, 13, planes 14, sorry, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, getting the cars back to, the, back to Waymart. A very big innovation. It was energy efficient, and it got the cars back there completely apart from the loaded cars. So you had, you had a two-way street. Things were really, really buzzing, going this way and coming back this way. The coasting without horse, everything was, it was. They managed to get five times the amount of coal to market in, 18, in the 1845 configuration than they did in 29. They, they, sent, they sent a half million tons of coal to market because of James Archibald's innovations, technological innovations. And um, the cars were then brought in 1845. They were then taken back to the top of the mountain above, above Carbondale, moved across the top of the mountain and then back down into Carbondale and reloaded. So that was, a, that was a, uh, an important innovation that he came up with in, in the 45 configuration. At the same time, the market kept saying, more coal, we need more coal. Even though they, were sent, they sent five times more in 1845 than they did in 1829. 
James Archibald and some of his buddies discovered in a community about seven miles south of Carbondale called Archibald, they discovered huge coal deposits. Archibald was, re was renamed, it used to be called White Oak Run, it was now called Archibald, in honor of James Archibald, who found all this coal there. They named it after him. Anyhow, so they, so they put the rail line, they put a rail line down to Archibald to get to tap into this new supply of coal. And they were bringing a lot, all that coal, bringing that coal also into Carbondale, funneling into the system, sending it over the mountain. And so, so they, they, were, they were, not only did the technology uh, uh, support the idea of getting more coal to market, but they had greater coal research reserves available to tap into. And so they, they brought, the, um, brought all that coal to Carbondale and sent it over the mountain. And as I say, by 1845, they then were, were sending five times more coal to the market than, than, they, than they did originally. Things went along very well, but the market still proclaimed we need more coal. So in 1859, a uh, remarkable person by the name of Charles of Pemberton Wirtz, who was the adopted son uh, of John Wirtz, who was the third president of the, of the DNH, Charles Pemberton Wirtz was a remarkable individual, and he's another one of my, I, I have such admiration for that guy. Charles F. Pemberton Wirtz uh, said, we, what we should do is we should get, make more planes on this side of the mountain, more planes and shorter planes, that way we can really just sort of pack it in there. So in, 18, in 18, 1859, in a completely new configuration of planes over the mountain, the, in 29 the planes went up this way, and in 45 they more or less went on the same pattern. In 59 they went this way over the mountain, and that's, what I, that's where I got the, the source of my my determination about configurations. It was different, slightly different, 29, 45, 59, but it was very, it was completely different. And so that was like the third, the third manifestation of this technology. So in 1859, they had eight planes, instead of five planes at the top of the mountain, they had eight planes. And they went on a whole new route. It was almost like 29 went that way, 59 went this way, a new route to get over the mountain, a more efficient route to get over the mountain get it over the mountain more easily. They brought it over the mountain, got it, to the, got it above, above Waymark, lowered it down two or three planes. It got on this 10 mile level, went coasting right into, right into Honesdale, and then the empty cars were brought back by means of these planes with the, uh, with the, um, with the water wheels. And then in 1859, it's really, it's, it's just, it's, it's one of the most remarkable moments in, 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 in in, uh, in American technology, you can, you can actually watch, you can watch their minds at work creating what they did on, literally it's on, on levels number eight and seven on the top of the Musick Mountain. What they did would take me 45 minutes to explain to you what they did, but they instituted a series of tracks on the top of that mountain so that the cars moved more or less independently and got them across the mountain, getting rid of all the horses, and the cars went across the top of the Moosic Mountain uh, by means of, 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 of planes that were detached from the, from the actual roadbed. They had one plane going this way, and it was farther. Than a, a very complicated system of planes, but it worked. It worked beautifully. And they were able to then uh, effectively get rid of horses as motive power. Horses are wonderful, we all love horses, especially being in Saratoga, we love horses. Anyhow, but these horses on the railroad, were, they were, they were, they were they're high maintenance. You can't work them endlessly, you have to get up them rest, you have to feed them, you have to clean after them, you have to hold them. It's so, it, it, so it's, getting rid of the horses was a, was a good thing to do for the railroad because the, the, uh, the mechanical technology was virtually inexhaustible, but the, but, and, and so they got rid of the horses. So in 1859, the horses were going on the top of the mountain and in, uh, throughout these plains, and uh, things got much better. And they got the coal across the top of the mountain, they got the cars back into, into Carbondale, and, and they loaded it up. The market, the unrelentingly hungry market, said, more coal. So they extended the, they extended the rail line oh, eight or nine miles farther down the Lackawanna Valley to get more coal mines and put in a, a very uh, a wonderfully complex system of planes to get the coal from those mines back to Carbondale. It, it's an amazingly intricate 
um, uh, system of planes. In one of those DVDs of mine, it takes like three or 400 pages to clarify just what they did. And so, and so, they, so they, they tapped into more coal mines way south of Carbondale in, in this village, in this place called Oliphant, and in, in Providence and in Scranton. At the same time that they had this system of planes, right, right next door to Scranton, which was the big city at the time, they then instituted, Charles Pemberton Ward said, wait a minute, let's, let's move people with these, these empty, let, let's create some passenger cars and move people at the same time. They, in, they implemented a, a rudimentary passenger service from Carbondale through all these planes to get you literally next door to, Car next door to Scranton, which was the big city at the time. And it was a huge success. People, they, you, 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 they, you couldn't get enough trains to carry people who wanted to go on this great adventure ride on a railroad. And so it was a huge success, passenger service. And uh, stagecoaches were put out of business. All this, everybody wanted to ride the railroad. At the same time, the, 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 the increasing appetite of the coal, of the coal companies, uh, they needed to get more coal. So from, from the base of that farthest plane away from, from, from Carbondale in Oliphant, they extended the rail line uh, 20 miles south to Wilkes-Barre. So there was a flat land gravity, essentially. There's the mountain gravity with the, this business, but at the base of plane number 23 in Oliphant, the car, the coal cars were then attached to gravity gauge, which is 51 inches, gravity gauge steam engines little choo-choo trains kind of stuff, not these great big challengers and you know, all that kind of stuff. They, were, they looked like little, almost like toy engines. There were six gravity gauge steam locomotives that pulled these gravity coal cars from Oliphant all the way to Wilkes-Barre. They put a third rail and a rail line that went down there, so you had standard gauge track cars on the same tracks with the gravity gauge cars. All the way they went to the Baltimore mines in Wilkes-Barre. In Wilkes-Barre, then, these coal cars were loaded with coal from the breakers in Wilkes-Barre, and the cars were then brought back 20 miles, being pulled by, by, by gravity gauge steam locomotives to the base of Plane 23 in Oliphant, and then sent through this system to Carbondale and over the mountain. But the, uh, these gravity gauge steam locomotives, uh, that's entirely new, this is all entirely new, new, new data in the history of of, uh, of, of the DNH. It, it, it's, I, I'm really very proud of having gotten that all together. But anyhow, they, they, they brought all this coal back to Carbondale, and, and they had the passenger system, 59. Everything was it was it was going along, along, uh, along beautifully, and they, they kept the they increased uh, uh, production as well. In 59, they met for the first time. They sent more than a million tons of coal to market through this system of five-ton coal cars over the mountain. A million tons of coal. A lot of coal. So in '59, things really began to move in, in high gear, and uh, they they were they were taking care of, of of market needs. Although not completely, because the, the call for more coal continued. In '68, they revised the railroad again, and in doing that, they they they, they kept kept refining. Um, refining the technology and make and perfecting the technology. One of the one of the remarkable things they did in 1868 was in the fourth configuration was they detached the light track completely from the loaded track. So that you're only dealing with the realities that you need to deal with. You don't have to worry about what are we going to do about them? Forget about them. We're going to deal with our own problem here. So they they, they created uh, what was one of the most remarkable things in the, in the whole history of the DNH in the 19th century, this light track from the top of the mountain at above, far, above Carbondale, Farview, they created uh, this, this the, the light track you could go on a, essentially a 15 mile roller coaster ride from the top of the mountain because the, the empty cars were brought in, they followed the ridge lines way up above Carbondale, gradually came down, all this under the free wheeling, they were not connected all the way down, all the way down, and then brought back right to Main Street in Carbondale. But because they were following the ridge lines and thought the descent was such that the cars didn't, weren't out of control, they were just, just enough to keep them moving. On this famous, on this light track, on which was located the, 
the very celebrated Shepherd's Crook on the Gravity Railroad. Uh, the car, let me read the, uh, the description of the Shepherd's Crook. Um, the, the railroad went down at the end and sort of snaked around in a tight curve like that. Shepherd's Crook, 400 feet in diameter, 2,000 feet long, with a grade of 110 feet in a mile. Track returned at the lower end of a loop within 80 feet of itself horizontally and 37 feet below the upper end. So that you could be on a train and you're here and the cars, the front of the train is down over there, but you're on the tail of it. So you can could, you could essentially see the, the head and the tail of the train at the same time. They put a passenger, they put passenger, the coal, this is for empty coal cars, all very well and good. But they then decided, since everybody wants to go for a train ride, let's build some fancy passenger coaches. So they built some very fancy passenger coaches and put them on this, this so-called shepherd's crook. It was a huge success. People came from as far away as metropolitan New York and Boston to ride on this railroad, on this 20-mile on this roller coaster ride through the woods, down through this thing. No engines, just coasting along. Remarkable. The, uh, it, it, the, as many, in, in, the, in, the, in the 1880s, they took as many as 15,000 people a day to the top of the mountain just to, for the thrill of riding on this railroad. At the top of the mountain also, they were very smart. They put in a, um, they built, put a park, they put a picnic park on the top of the mountain. The park in the top of the mountain at Farview was 600 acres. In that park were nothing but swings, picnic benches, drinking water, fountains, promenades, and they had a coach ride up there as well. But people by the tens of thousands went up there to get out of the grimy, dirty, industrial valley and go to the top of the mountain for picnics. You had to essentially reserve a spot in that park months in advance in order to get there because with like 15,000 people, they only had a certain number of cars to get people up there and had to get them back. And they had all manner of things on the top of the mountain, balloon ascensions and all, all sorts of old fashioned things, tennis courts, baseball, to, to, to get people to go to the top of the mountain. But, but 600 acre park with two observatories from the top of one of the observatories, I don't remember the number right now, but you can see something like 24 lakes and 17 villages from the top of, the, of, the, of, of, this, one, of, of this one observatory. So you climb up like this old fashioned fire tower at the top and you can see forever. It was a huge success. And they made money, their main business was to, to get coal to market. But like all the, like all the trolley companies, and they, knew, they, they always, the trolley companies were very smart. Put them at the end of a rail line, and people are going to ra ride the rail line in order to get to your amusement park. They did that as a matter of, always, they always did that. The, 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 the amusement parks were always on rail lines. And the, 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 they knew what they were doing. You make a lot of money that way. So anyhow, this, 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 uh, this shepherd's crook, as it's called, was, was an enormous uh, tourist attraction. People, as I say, came from far and wide. The, the, in, the, in the newspapers in the, in the summertime, uh, they, list, they published the list of who was going to Farview, or to Farview Park uh, for, for, for the next 10 days. And there were all church groups, uh, community groups, all kinds of civic organizations. I find articles that say something like, 26 cars of Sunday school students from the First Presbyterian Church went to the top of the mountain on Thursday. 26 rail cars. The numbers are just so hard to believe. Thousands of people going up and, and, and in these huge picnic excursions. All the women dressed in fancy, sort of, you know, long white dresses and hats and stuff of the guys in, in, in boaters. All this going to the top of the mountain in the middle of all this grimy uh, coal business. One of the points I make in one of those volumes is the fact that the, the, the quality of life, the, the quality of life in the, in, in the coal regions at, in, in this, at this time was very good. A lot of people seem to want to want to whine and mope and cry about, oh, we, we lived in a tar paper shack. And stuff. A lot of people had a rough time, but life got better. People, if, if you worked hard, life was better for your children than it was for you, maybe. It was an upward path. You may have started out in pretty rough circumstances, but if you committed yourself to building a better future for your, in your, for your children and you, it could work. And so, the, but all, all levels of society were part of this thing, 
And a lot of, granted, there were a lot of very fancy folks who went to the top of the mountain who didn't probably work a day in their life, but there were a lot of, a lot of wonderful, uh, hardworking folks who on, on weekends went up to the top of the mountain to get out of this industrial valley. So the whole range of, of, of all the social orders were, were, were one met there. So it was like a melting, melting pot. So that, that the cars were then brought down the mountain through this gradual thing. Another thing they did in 68 was they had to, they had to get the cars from the top of that mountain, because by 68 they were, they were actually taking, taking regular steam locomotives to the top of the mountain. They had to get them down on the other side, and they, so they did that by, by following the ridge lines again. It went like five or six miles that way. Full-size steam locomotives on the top of the mountain gradually following the ridge line, and it came back down and got them back into, back into Carbondale. So the, the amazing, the, the technology of making that happen it, it is, is, is astonishing, and they, and they really, they were very good at it. They, they, had this, they had a gradual way of getting the cars up and down the mountain, and the cars kept getting bigger and bigger as the century went on. And so by 1883, they were sending four million tons of coal a year to market. That's really just unbelievable. Four million tons of coal is a lot of coal. And still, the market said, we need more coal. And you, you can imagine the profitability of the d &H. They had They had the largest anthracite deposit in North America. They had a rail system. They had an, and a hungry market. <coughs> Send us more coal. They were making so much money. It cost, 50, it cost 50 cents to ride the train to the top of the mountain to go to that park. So 15,000 people on a day, that put, that put $7,500 in your pocket. That was a bonus to the d &H. But $7,500 in 1868 is a lot, of, a lot of bananas. And so they got them to the top of the mountain. But anyhow, so they were making a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of money off of passenger service, in addition to coal, coal mine, coal, coal mine. And, and uh, so, so it, was a, it, was, it was an immensely profitable system of, 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 of transportation. And this went on from, from 68 all the way to, to, the, to the end of the century. And the, uh, the passenger service was the, was, the real, was the real plum. An interesting thing that happened in, in um, actually, it actually took place in, in, in just right, right at the set in the late 60s. All this coal, a hungry market, suddenly they arrived at a point in the late 60s where somebody decided, wait a minute, we've got extra coal here. They're not, I think maybe we've reached market satiety. That we have, we have the coal is stock, we're stockpiling the, the coal. And it, it, it's a very interesting thing that happened at that point because as soon as they had reached market needs, well, if you're an effective manager, what do you, what do you, well, you have to do something. Well, you gotta do something about it. You can't just sort of keep stacking it up. You gotta correct the problem so they cut back on production. So if you cut back on production, maybe you can cut back on employees, or maybe you can, you know, maybe you can, instead of working five days, you work four days. And with these, with these, with these cutbacks that happened in the late '60s, immediately, it, it, it's really, really quite remarkable. Labor problems. A bunch of people then uh, met and wanted to speak to the management of the DNH. And the remarkable thing about the DNH was that man, the manage, their, their labor management problems were minuscule compared to some of the other companies. It's because the managers are such smart managers. The door was always open. One of the most remarkable presidents, his name was Thomas Dixon. They would, the, the workers, a delegation with Mr. Dixon, we need, we need money. We need, we, we got, we got, okay guys, I understand. We're trying to solve this problem and we're working on it. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. He had an open door policy. He listened to their, listened to their concerns and then made an effort to solve them, and that made the that and then did solve them, and so the labor problems uh, were, were were minimal. But the but you can see the labor problems being born uh, in relationship to production, overproduction, cut back and, and cut back, and then you sort of solve your your overproduction. But then you got to be very careful not to not to uh, not to alienate uh, not not to alienate the workers. And uh, I have a I have a volume on. Uh, I call it the troubled 1870s, because in the 1870s, things really went sour in a lot of the anthracite fields. That's when all the, 
well, that's when all the Molly Maguire business happened and you had all kinds of terrible labor problems and lots of violence and nastiness about unhappy workers. Not so much for the DNH, but for other coal companies. The DNH was, was, a, was a pretty benign employer and they were a very large company and they had a lot of power, but they were also very, they, were, they had a very sort of humanitarian approach to the, uh, to the, to the management of the, uh, of the company. And one of the remarkable things about the, um, the management of the, uh, of the DNH is, and I really, I think somebody ought to write a full length book on it, is, is the management technique of the DNH managers. This business of getting the brightest and best people involved was, was, was basic operational policy. Lots of managers think they can solve all their problems themselves and they don't get the brightest and best involved and that leads to problems. The DNH did it in 1823 when they got Benjamin Wright and John Jarvis down there, help us solve this problem, getting over that mountain. They did it repeatedly. In, um, in the 1830s, they, be, they, they were sending a lot of coal to market. Some of, it was, some of it was surface coal, which wasn't particularly the best quality coal. It, 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 the oxidation, and it, it was not the, the deep down coal was the really good stuff. So some of this coal, they, had, they, they began to have problems with the quality of coal. We've got to correct this problem. Now we can't just sort of send this surface coal to market. They recruited, they actively recruited in Scotland and Wales, shaft sinkers. People, guys who knew how to establish a mine shaft down and then tunnels off. If you and I went out there to do it, we probably would have the whole thing collapse. I, I would, I mean, how would it collapse on top of me? But if you know what you're doing, you go down and then you can put tunnels. But they actively recruited shaft sinkers. They sent people from the, from the Lackawanna Valley to Wales and to Scotland. And one of the most remarkable, his name was Archibald Law. Archibald Law came and he really saved the DNH in 1830 by showing them how to do the deep underground shaft mining. Another thing the DNH did, which was, which was, um, was, was, was very indicative of of, of, of their getting the, getting the best, brightest and best people involved was, is in the 1830s, they sent somebody to Wales who recruited 90 Welsh families and said, come to America, all of you, come to America. We're paying for all this, come to America. They brought 90 Welsh families to Carbondale and to show them how to effectively do anthracite mining. The Welsh have been doing it forever. And so they recruited these 90 Welsh families, brought them to Carbondale. In 1830 in Carbondale, there were three Welsh churches in 1830 in Carbondale, which is really quite amazing, in the wilderness, nothing. But three Welsh churches and 90 Welsh families in Carbondale uh, showing the DNH how to, um, how to do uh, uh, deep underground mining. And the Welsh, like anybody else at that point, anyhow, only married each other. If you're Welsh, you're only marrying somebody who's Welsh. You're not marrying a Czechoslovakian or a Pole. You're wearing, marrying somebody who's Welsh. Or, and and if, you're, if you're Italian, you're marrying an Italian. That's how, that, that's how the world used to be configured. Now there's a, lot, there's a lot of crossing of lines. But at the time, the Welsh only married the Welsh. The Czechoslovakians only married the Czechoslovakians. And the Poles only married the Poles. Because of that remarkable, that sort of ethnic strength, if you will. I'm half Welsh, and my family, my father's great-grandparents have been here since the 1840s, but they only married each other. And so my father was 100% Welsh, even though his great-grandparents were born in America. They only, only married Welsh, only married Welsh. You know, kind of, and so that, that, happens, uh, uh, that happened a lot in the industrial valleys at the time. These very strong communities had wonderful things you have Welsh community with Welsh churches. You have Czechoslovakian community with Czechoslovakian churches. Poles, Slovenians, Russians, Ukrainians. Until 30 years ago, they were all distinctly there. You could identify, there's the Ukrainian church, there's the Lithuanian church, there's this, these very strong ethnic communities in this whole anthracite, uh, anthracite uh, stupak. The engineers who were at the top of these planes operating these stationary engines, a very crucial position, the, the, the responsibilities of that man operating the head of the plane. The DNH recruited in New York five stationary engine engineers to come to Carbondale and to 
assume those very key positions. So that, that's, those are just a small handful of examples about the, about the sagacity of these managers. Get the brightest people involved. Pay them well and, 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 and solve their problems. And so they did this over and over, and it's really a, a remarkable, a remarkable uh, uh, thing. The, um, another remarkable thing about, about uh, a lot of these, uh, about this, the management of the DNH in the 19th century was a lot of them were Scottish, which pleases me enormously because my mother's family were all Scots. And so that the, the, in my stuff on the DNA here, I began to collect a lot of things on, uh, I, have, I have a section, one of them called Great Scott. I don't know, if, if maybe, you, maybe you recognize that, but when I was growing up, my parents and grandparents would say, uh, say to my brothers and I, Great Scott, I told you 50 times not to you know, use that sharp knife. In other words, instead of saying something else, he said, great Scott, you know, which he said, she's, damn it, you kid. You know, but the, the great Scott was, was, was a standard kind of thing. So I, I created in one of these, one of those section called Great Scots, F-F-O-T-S. And there's a huge number of, of, of people of Scottish descent who were in important managerial positions in the, in the DNH in the 19th century. And that, I think, that has to be there's, there's enough material there to do a full-size book on, on the, Scottish, the Scottish Enlightenment, the Scottish Renaissance in America. Places like Princeton and New Jersey are just loaded with, with high-level Scottish folks. And uh, Princeton University is practically a Scottish organization. But the, but the, uh, the, the, the Scottish in, in the Lackawanna Valley is a very interesting uh, thing. But not any less interesting, we have mine signs, for example, in Carbondale that say, uh, on the top line, it says something to the effect of, if you're hurt, make sure your supervisor knows about it. On the line below it, it says the same thing in Czechoslovakian, in Polish, Hungarian, in Slovenian, in Italian. The same sign, these, these six languages on signs saying, if you get hurt, make sure your supervisor knows about it. So that the, um, it's, uh, so the, the ethnicity of the, of the anthracite fields in the 19th century is, is, um, is very interesting. So the, with, with this 1868 configuration, they got, they got a lot of coal market, they met market needs, and then they introduced steam locomotives, conventional steam locomotives, into, the, into this system. And as I said, they, they managed by following the ridge lines to get these steam locomotives to the top of the mountain and then lower them down the other side of the mountain. So it went from, that, and that was essentially configuration number five, when they, when they got the, uh, the steam locomotives uh, to, the, to the top of the mountain by a, a, a very wonderful and complex system of planes and levels and things. But it went from the 18, uh, 1829 configuration, which was simply just, as I said, this one track with, with turnouts and so on, to this very advanced system of, of uh, transportation with steam locomotives. And, and so in 1899, uh, configuration number five became a reality, and the, the railroad uh, was, was just going along full steam ahead. They were making tons of money and everything, all kinds of prosperity. So this gravity, the system, which started out to be a gravity system, ended up being a steam locomotive system. But it was a steam locomotive system over a thousand foot high mountain. And the remarkable thing about gravity is it, this was a gravity railroad. But once you got the cars to the top of that mountain, gravity began working for you because the weight of the cars provided the energy to move them forward. When this coal was all loaded into canal boats at Honesdale, the, uh, it's also a gravity system because the canal bed in Honesdale is about a, th about a thousand feet above sea level at, at Kingston, New York, where the, where the, where the coal was taken to send it to, to New York City. So from the top of the mountain to Honesdale, you did this. At Honesdale, the coal got in the coal boats, and the canal and the coal was then into the, in one canal boat, in a lock, the water was let out, the canal goes down, goes down. So the canal functions in terms of gravity as well. And, and, and it got to, the, uh, got to the Hudson River. So from, 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 for 120 miles from, from Carbondale to the Hudson River, gravity was was put to work on the railroad, and gravity was put to work on the, on, on the canal. And 
this really changed everything in America. The remarkable thing, and I think there's also a lot of work that could be done on, 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 this, on this system they created. As I said, they were creating a technology as they went along. And one of the remarkable things about the technology they were creating was, is that the workers were more or less stationary. You work at the bottom of plane number one. You work at the head of plane number one. You work on level number two. You work on level number three. You work. The workers were stationary. They lived near where they worked. And so they went to work by going to their workstation right there at the head of plane whatever it was, or level number whatever it was, and the coal came to them. They didn't all go to like one joint place. They worked along this 125 long, 125 mile long corridor, which is the prototype of Henry Ford's production line. The Henry Ford workers were at production line. The work came to them. They did their job. They screwed on a few bolts and nuts, passed it on to the next person who did the same thing. So the work moved through the, the, the Ford production system on a, essentially a conveyor belt where you did your job, you did your job, but you did it, the work came to you. And so what happened in, 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 the, in the Lackawanna Valley was, is that we had like a, a, a 125 mile long conveyor belt because somebody got the coal from the, from the mine into a mine car. The car taken to here, taken to there, taken to there. And so this, 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 this 125 mile long uh, conveyor belt. And the, the, uh, the, the, the problem could also be then, what if something goes wrong on lock number 27 on the canal? There's a washout. It has to stop. So the production line then, if you can't get the you can't get your coal past lock 27, then on lock 26 you've got a problem. 25, 24, 23, all the way back to Homesdale. There are no boats in Homesdale because it's they're not moving forward. So it's sort of a flaw in the system. There, once, once, the, once the conveyor belt stops, you've got to solve that. You've got to solve the problem fast, or you're not going to get the coal to market. At one point in the 19th century, an extraordinary man by the name of John Augustus Robley, who later built the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, built four aqueducts for the for the DNH Canal. One of those aqueducts washed out in a bad summer storm uh, in in the in the late 60s. 500 men were put to work on getting that aqueduct back operational. 500 men to get that aqueduct going because it was in the middle of the summer and with forward movement stopped. What are we going to do? We, we, you've got to get across the Lackawax River. They, they, they finally got it fixed, but, but, it, but can you imagine putting 500 people to work on the, uh, in, 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 into solving that problem? It's a... Um, but, but they, they, they realized what they had to do, and they did it. And, and uh, but the, the, the history of the DNH, especially in the 19th century, is just unbelievable. They were, they were astonishing minds at work solving problems. And the, uh, I, I don't have a, any doubt in my mind at all that with all this coal going to market from the Lackawanna Valley, as I said, there was, there was an energy crisis. We need, we need to get fuel. This fuel from the Lackawanna and Wyoming Valleys in, in, in Pennsylvania in the 19th century made possible the industrialization of America. Up to that point in American history, we were largely an agrarian nation, small family farms, little villages, no, no, very little industry of any kind. With this coal from the Lackawanna Valley and Wyoming Valleys in, in Pennsylvania and through the DNA transportation system, Everything in America changed. It became an industrialized nation. And it, it's, uh, I, I could provide you five dump trucks full of evidence to support that argument. But the, it, it's, a, it's, it's a remarkable fact. And we should, I, I, I think we all should be very proud of that fact. The DNH uh, came as far as, as Saratoga very early in, um, in, um, in, let's see, what's the year, 1867. In 1867, the DNH did not have a rail line to get to Saratoga Springs. But yet in 1867, when the Congress Hall, when Congress Hall was, the newly built Congress Hall was being built, the DNH contributed significantly to the building of that, of that hotel. 
they knew they were going to get here eventually. So they, they, they became an investor very early, very early on. And, and uh, the new Albrecht Congress Hall, built in 1867, with the help of the DNH, the Congress had 11 stores fronting Broadway, 600 rooms, a promenade plaza 20 feet wide, 250 feet long, an observatory on, observatory on top. After personal inspection, the hotel commissioner of the New York Times pronounced Congress Hall, quote, the best and most thoroughly equipped summer house in America. I think that's lovely. Another, another uh, interesting thing about, uh, about the DNH in Saratoga is that in 1872, they invested $25,000 in, in building the United States Hotel here in, in, in 1872. And they had no way to get here at the time. But they, but they, but they invested this money. It's, it's, like, it's the classic thing of like throwing your hat over the fence. They knew eventually they were going to get there. So they became an investor very early, which was very smart. And uh, the uh, one, one, one final, uh, one final note on the um, on the uh, on, on Saratoga, which is interesting. I, I've been, I'm working on it pretty actively now, but I have this this uh, notion that, well, I know, I, know, I know from studying timetables in the Lackawanna and Wyoming Valleys in Pennsylvania in the 1860s, all of a sudden there appears in a timetable, a DNH timetable, a train called Saratoga Express. 1867 in the Lackawanna Valley in Carbondale. And this train, sorry, not, excuse me, 1873, this train Began in, began in Philadelphia, came to Wilkes-Barre, went to Scranton, stopped in Carbondale, and then went from Carbondale to Nineveh, to, to Albany, to Troy, and to Saratoga in, 18, in 1873, the, 1870, the, the Saratoga Express. On this train, there were Pullman palace cars zipping through the grimy, dirty, industrial Lackawanna Valley. And here you had this, this luxury train getting people here in 1873. I think that maybe that, that, that train is probably the first named passenger train in America. If there was one before that, I'd be, I'd be very happy to back off. But I, I don't, I, I've, I've talked with a lot of people about this, but I think this 1873 Saratoga Express through the Lackawanna Valley in, 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 in Pennsylvania might be the, the, uh, the first named passenger train in America, and as you know, uh, later on, there were there were many passenger trains with, with names, uh, you know, like like the Orient Express, that kind of stuff. There were not lots of them, but the Saratoga Express was a uh, was was a, uh, a a nice thing to think about coursing through the the, the, the heavy duty industrial Lackawanna Valley people coming uh, coming up here. So the the DNH is is a uh, is, is as I think many of us realize is was an astonishing railroad and innovation after innovation after innovation and uh, it's not surprisingly that they were so successful in doing what they did and uh, for 20 years I have been trying I've been working on chronically what they have done and I'm feeling pretty good about about those about those 20 years and it just becomes more uh, the more I the more I learned about the DNA the more remarkable I think they come and uh, it's a great pleasure to speak to you tonight in this remarkable town, in this remarkable room about a remarkable company. Thank you very much. Possibly, uh, if someone has a question, I might be able to answer your question, sir.